Good evening again. Um, just a quick comment about process before we get started uh, with the official meeting. The public do now have an opportunity with comprehensive reports to be given a five minute uh, opportunity to ask questions or make comments. Um, that's after the committee has an opportunity and after the, uh, the presentation by, in this case tonight, by staff. Uh, if if uh, you would care to do that, just give your name and address so the clerk can record it in the minutes. Um, Councillor Kiley is my vice chair. If you see me jump up and bolt out of here partway through the meeting, uh, my only daughter just went into labor. So I, I may be rushing out of here. And it isn't a political statement if you're in the middle of speaking. So thank you very much. I'll call the meeting to order if I can. And uh, the first order of business is the approval of the agenda. If there's a mover and a seconder, Councillor Hill and Councillor Kiley. All those, oh, including the addendum. All those in favor? Carried. Uh, confirmation of minutes from our September 5th meeting. Uh, I psychically think Councillor Hutchison and Councillor Sanic are about to move and second that. Minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much. All those in favor? Carried. Uh, disclosure of pecuniary interest. Seeing none. Uh, we have no delegations. We have no briefings. I'm just going to read a brief statement about uh, a business statement. This portion of the meeting is open to the public. The city has initiated a new process in which members of the public will have the opportunities to speak for up to five minutes on comprehensive reports represented, presented before the planning committee. Those wishing to provide oral comments at this meeting will be invited to do so. If a person or public body would otherwise have an ability to appeal the decision of the Council of the Corporation of the City of Kingston to the local planning appeal tribunal, but the person or public body does not make oral submissions at a public meeting or make written submissions to the City of Kingston before the bylaw is passed, that person or public body is not entitled to appeal the decision. Um, so we'll move on to our first order of business, which is, res I'm reading the wrong page. Uh, there we go. I almost got this out of order. Uh, is the Reddendale neighborhood uh, uh, zoning bylaw amendment? And uh, we do have a staff presenter. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sukriti Agarwal, and I'm an acting uh, planning initiatives manager with the uh, city's planning division. And I'm here to present um, the recommendations related to the city-initiated zoning bylaw amendment for the Redendale neighborhood and also proposed design guidelines for the area. So this work stems from a council motion from December 19th of 2017, uh, which directed staff to advise them on the feasibility of developing a planning framework that was specific to addressing infill development pressures in the Redendale area to ensure that it was compatible with the physical character of the area. Um, on January 23, 2018, uh, staff presented a scope of work to council, which was approved by council at that meeting. So just, just a very quick uh, background and timeline on this work. Um, after uh, council approved the scope of work, a community working group was established by council on March 20th of 2018. Um, staff worked alongside the working group and Dillon Consulting Limited to come up with initial zoning recommendations which were presented at an open house in October of 2018. After that, the recommendations were further refined and were presented at a statutory public meeting before the planning committee in March of 2019. 
Based on the feedback received, another open house was held in April of this year. Uh, staff have considered all of the input that has been uh, submitted to date, and um, tonight we are here to present the comprehensive report to planning committee. The subject lands um, are, uh, is the area known as Renendale. Um, th this area is uh, located south of Front Road, west of Sunny Acres Road, um, in the west end of the city of Kingston. The uh, lands are designated residential in the city's official plan, and the 30-meter riparian corridor along the shoreline is designated environmental protection area. These lands are designated R1-3, in zoning bylaw number 7626, uh, which permits uh, single detached dwellings um, um, on these lands. The purpose of the zoning bylaw amendment is to update the residential zoning standards that are applied within this area. Um, it is proposed um, that the amendments will be carried forward into the new citywide zoning bylaw. So I'm just going to briefly go over the proposed amendments. Um, the first one is uh, lot coverage. Um, currently, there are no lot coverage requirements in the area, which means that um, dwellings can occupy a, a large percentage of the lot area. Uh, it is proposed, uh, a 30% lot coverage is proposed for this area um, to to ensure that the building size is proportional to the lot size. The height of buildings currently that are permitted is 35 feet, which is measured from finished grade. The height is not proposed to be changed. However, how the height is, pro is measured is proposed to be changed, and I'll, I'll, I can uh, go over that um, in, in a slide with a graphic. Uh, another change that we are proposing is the ribbon of life setback. Um, this is a policy in the city's official plan which requires a 30-meter setback for all new development from the shoreline. Um, the, intent is, um, the intent of the setback is to maintain a sufficient buffer from, from, um, from the water bodies. Um, and this buffer also uh, provides uh, stormwater management and also um, plant and wildlife habitat act and passive recreational areas adjacent to the waterfront. Um, so in, in alignment with these policies, a 30-meter setback from the high water mark of Lake Ontario is proposed for all buildings and structures, uh, including decks and porches, verandas, swimming pools, and associated structures. Uh, however, this proposed setback would not apply to a marine facility, for example, um, a boathouse, uh, because those type of uses are um, intended to be located on the water or right adjacent to the water. Uh, staff are also recommending some changes to the existing definitions that apply within, this, uh, within the zoning bylaw. Uh, the first one is finished grade. Um, uh, the finished grade means the average elevation of the finished surface of the ground at the base of a structure. Um, staff are proposing to amend this definition to an established grade which would mean the average elevation of the undisturbed ground measured at the two points where the required frontier depth meets the side lot lines. And again, I can explain this um, using a graphic. Um, we are also proposing amendments to the definition of lot coverage specific to um, residential development um, because the current definition of lot coverage also considers uh, commercial type uses. So we were, we, we've tailored the definition specifically to um, residential development. Um, types of um, structures that would be excluded from lot coverage include un unenclosed steps and porches, patios, decks, and balconies, bay, windows, canopies, and overhanging eaves, which are two more meters or more in height above the established grade. Um, and the other definition that is being proposed to be amended is height. Like I mentioned, currently height is measured from the finished grade, and um, it is proposed that it be measured from the established grade instead. And um, a definition for normal high water mark is also proposed to be added to uh, address the ribbon of life setback um, that is being proposed as part of this amendment. So just, um, I just have a few graphics to explain what these um, uh, few changes mean. 
Um, so in, uh, to the left is um, the, the graphic shows the potential building footprint that is currently allowed by the zoning bylaw. So as you can see um, over here, if, you, if we leave all of the yard setbacks out, a building could be built which, is, which could be approximately between 60 to 65% of uh, lot coverage. Um, the potential building envelope is shown in this blue box in the middle. So what we are proposing to change is the, um, uh, the building footprint coverage at 30% of the lot area, which means that only this portion of the lot uh, may be covered by a building. Uh, like I mentioned, we are also um, proposing an amendment to establish grade, um, which would be uh, measured at the side lot lines, um, where the side lot lines intersect with the required front yard setback and taking the elevations at those two points. Um, this, the primary reason behind uh, making this change is uh, to prevent the artificial raising of grade, which um, which has occurred in the area, which, which uh, makes some buildings appear to be taller than they actually are. So again, just a graphic explaining how the height will be measured. Um, this, this is, um, in, in the upper graphic, the left side is the street. Um, and then this is the required front yard. The grade will be the average elevation of um, of the points where the side lot lines meet the front lot line. So this is for a regular lot. Similarly, for a waterfront lot, which actually slopes towards the water, um, uh, the, the height would be measured again from the established grid at, at the six meter setback, which is the required front yard setback. Uh, the ribbon of life, like I mentioned, is a 30 meter setback from the normal, normal high water mark of Lake Ontario. So, um, so any new development would be required to be set back at least 30 meters from the high water mark. Staff have received a number of comments with respect to non-conforming and non-compliant status as a result of the proposed uh, zoning bylaw amendments. Uh, non-conforming, non-complying, this means that um, the Planning Act indicates that if, if any land or building or structure was established at a time when it was permitted under previous zoning regulations, the land, building, or structure may continue to be used for that purpose. So the zoning bylaw, it, 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 it doesn't mean that if, if for example, a, a dwelling is located within the 30 meter setback from the waterfront, that, that dwelling would have to be removed. That is really not the, um, that's, that's really not what's meant by non-conforming. Uh, that building may continue to be used as a residential dwelling because it was permitted under the previous zoning regulations. There, there has been, um, there was a recent uh, Ontario Municipal Board decision which is now called the Local Planning Appeal Tribunal, which indicated that all owners who use legal non-complying buildings and structures on their lands have an acquired right that cannot be modified or taken away. Such rights include the right to demolish and reconstruct a building or structure at the same location. So if, if, if the dwelling was, is non-conforming and if there was a need to reconstruct it at the same location, that would be permitted. Um, such rights also include the right to seek planning approval to expand or enlarge the legal non-compliant building. So this means that a minor variance could be obtained if uh, someone wished to enlarge a legal non-complying building. Staff have also built in transition provisions in the proposed zoning bylaw. Um, these basically um, are intended to um, give any previous minor variances that have been approved and any building permit applications that have been submitted before the zoning bylaw amendment is passed to be able to continue under the previous zoning um, regulations. Um, as part of this work, um, a set of design guidelines is also proposed. Uh, these guidelines provide guidance for new residential development and redevelopment within the Redendale 
neighborhood to ensure that the development complements the character of the neighborhood. Uh, these, these guidelines elaborate on the intent of the zoning bylaw. These are not regulations, these are guidelines. Um, and these are intended to assist applicants when preparing um, planning act submissions and also intended to assist staff and committees when assessing applications for development in the area. So um, these design guidelines speak to a number of things such as orientation and entryways, uh, front yard setbacks, rear and side yard setbacks, uh, massing and build form height, building style and detailing, building materials and colors, roof, dormers, windows and doors, driveways and soft landscaping. Um, the intent of the guidelines is to um, encourage complementary um, uh, forms of development. Uh, they, they do not dictate things such as color um, or the style of doors. Uh, a, a variety of these type of um, forms are uh, encouraged in the area. Staff have received uh, comments from members of the public both in support and against um, the initial recommendations and also the revised recommendations that are uh, that have been presented tonight. Um, the comments reflect a diversity of opinions. Um, at the time of writing of the staff report, uh, we had received 137 pieces of correspondence and to date I have, um, we've received approximately 170. Uh, the additional correspondence that uh, was received after finalizing of the staff report uh, was included in the August 15 planning committee addendum and um, and there are some items that are um, er, that were received uh, after August 15th are included in the addendum for tonight. Uh, staff recommendation is that uh, this application for zoning bylaw amendment be approved and that the design guidelines for residential lots in Redendale be endorsed by council and that staff be directed to utilize the design guidelines for residential lots in Redendale as part of the development review process for applications within this area. Um, and this concludes my presentation. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Um, we'll first go into a uh, committee if there are any uh, committee mem members with questions. Now would be a good time to ask. Yes, Councillor Chappelle. Thank you, through your chair. With respect to the uh, <clears throat> properties on the Ribbon of Life uh, with a 30 meter setback, how many non conforming buildings will that create? Built like current residents with non-conforming status? Um, there will be a number of properties that will be conforming. Um, staff the exact number of how many um, lots would or buildings would become non-conforming, but what I can say is that yes, an, an, a large number of the waterfront lots, um, sorry, not the lots, but development on those lots would become non-conforming. I'm, frankly, I, I'm a little surprised you don't have an actual number because I can go on Google Earth and count them. But uh, the question I have with the respect that it would, following up with that, how many vacant lots or how many lots of parcels of land that have not yet been developed does this impact? Um, again, I'm, I apologize, but I don't have that number. Um, there are, um, most of the lots have building envelopes outside of the 30 meter setback. The official plan policies do allow um, for consideration of development on lots where, where a 30 meter setback cannot be achieved um, through applications for um, a minor variance um, and subject to review by the Cataraqui Region Conservation Authority. So what that means is that uh, it's not so, that- So you don't have a number then? I'm sorry? You don't have a number? No, don't. I don't have a number of vacant lots. With respect to the 30% um, maximum proposal, the way I read that is that this also includes the house, but also includes the garage as well. Is that correct? The 30% lot coverage would include an attached garage, but not a detached garage. So if someone wanted to build, but the detached garage would be part of that 30%, would it not? A detached garage is um, uh, allowed at 10% of lot coverage. 
So um, the zoning bylaw contains um, lot coverage requirements for detached accessory buildings, which is not proposed to be changed. So a detached garage would be subject to those regulations. Where in the city do we have a 30% lot coverage maximum? Others other than proposed here in Redendale? Um, there are um, some site-specific zones which do have um, that lot coverage, especially um, the A zone ha in the downtown area has a lot coverage of 33 and a third. Um, and there are several site-specific zones throughout the city which have maybe not exactly 30%, but they do have 35% lot coverage, but um, those lots are smaller in size and that's why um, the lot coverage that is permitted is larger than 30%. And what would be the normal lot coverage if it wasn't 30%? Because it's non-described in, in a number of community, a number of planning reports. What is the average currently being provided as a maximum lot coverage? So. Um, Um, my apologies for the uh, delay. Um, so approximately 94% of the lots in the Redendale area have a lot coverage of 30% uh, uh, or less. Um, the maximum lot coverage in the area is um, between 45 and 50% for, for a lot uh, which is way smaller, which is much smaller in size than the average lots in the area. The average lots in the area are about 10,000 square feet. Would it be unreasonable for a councillor in a different district where this doesn't impact to request a zoning amendment for their district to not have lot sizes coverage over the 30 percent? Well, council members can <laughs> absolutely no. do that. The, the question I'm asking is certainly a lot of people would love to live in the Redendale area and because of the larger lot sizes. But when you get into the urban areas, we have postage stamp lots with parking issues and all kinds of problems. Maybe, would you, would you suggest that perhaps a 30% lot coverage would be good to be appropriate across the entire um, Kingston area? And the reason I ask that is because we still are trying to have a comprehensive zoning bylaw, and you're setting a cement here that many communities would like to have. Um, so, I don't, I don't think that we could apply a 30% lot coverage citywide because um, it, would depend, it would depend on the... Um, in this area, lot sizes are, are larger than, we, than what we find in several other areas of the city. Um, like I mentioned, there are several site-specific zones that do allow for a larger lot coverage, for example, 35% or 40%, but that's based on the lot sizes in that area. So we, we, we as part of the new zoning bylaw, we, we are um, looking at potentially a lot coverage, but I don't think that that number would be 30% across the city because of the varying lot sizes. What would that number likely be? Um, I don't know, but I can look into that and get back to you. Okay, and um, so I asked the ribbon of life. Um, the current height that's proposed based on the level land on lots between lots Will that proposal you put forward, will that restrict a three-story home from being built? Um, that will likely not restrict a three-story home to be built because um, it, it, it also depends on the shape of the roof. So if, if, if there was a sloping roof, likely a three-story home would not be able to be built. However, if somebody wished to build using a flat roof, they could still do three stories depending on um, ceiling heights. So if they lowered the ceiling heights for, for the floors, they could still get three stories with a flat roof. 
So from my understanding of what a lot of the angst in the community is a three-story monstrosity that probably should never have been built. Why doesn't this address that height issue so that you could prevent something like that from being built again? So um, um, the zoning bylaws generally for single detached dwellings, they don't regulate by the number of stories. They, they regulate by a maximum height limit in meters or feet. Um, 10.7 meters that is um, currently allowed in this area and not proposed to be changed is the maximum height that is uh, permitted across most of the low density zones throughout the city. Um, and three stories does represent a low rise form of development. As such, we are not proposing to change that. Um, the other thing is that um, nowadays the norm is higher ceilings. Um, so at, at 35 feet or 10.7 meters, like it, it could still be a two-story home with, with higher ceilings. Um, the other thing, um, I, I did speak with uh, one of our um, building inspectors regarding that, and um, one of the other things is that the slope of roofs is regulated by the building code as well, so they we want to ensure that the slopes can be achieved within the height limit. Um, in some areas, a bedrock is really high, so um, um, people are not able to dig in as much as they would like to, so the basements are um, are more above grade as compared to below grade, so that all affects the height as well. Well, I find that interesting in the sense that it's 10.7 meters across the city and it's something that's applied across the city, yet we're having a special lot size for Could, Reddendale. I'm so, sorry, Tim. Can we uh, focus on the report in front of us, which is a specific well, geographic gonna, area? Yeah. And questions about citywide or other districts, those are political questions. They aren't planning questions based on the report before Granted, us, Mr. Chair. Uh, what, what I was just going to say, with, and I was just trying to build the, the, the discussion around that framework, is that if the concern in the past from many of the residents I spoke with was the height of a three-story building, why would we not also consider reducing the height, maximum height from 10.7 meters to something smaller that would allow for the pitched roofs, allow for large, or like 10 store, uh, 10 foot ceilings in, in the main rooms and make sure that the building was actually contained to a two story building? So um, to address that, we, we have um, proposed changes to how height is measured using established grade as opposed to finished grade. Um, um, because using established grade will, will lower the height of the building from 35 feet, the way it's measured currently. Okay, thank you. Thank Thanks. you for the clarification. Thank you. Uh, any further questions? Councillor Carley, Vice Chair Carley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you for your presentation, especially the visuals were very helpful in conceptualizing how the buildings would fit on the lot. Uh, you showed the front yard setback of six meters. Can you talk about the side yard setbacks? Where can a building be situated in relation to the side lot lines? Yes, um, through you, uh, Mr. Chair, the current side yard setback is a minimum of four feet. Uh, however, where there is no attached garage or carport, one side has to be at least eight feet. Okay, and this leads me to height as well, specifically, concerning flat roofs and the potential for balconies. You mentioned that balconies wouldn't be ca calculated um, as part of the square footage for the lot coverage. Now, if you have a balcony on a third floor that close to the side lot line, is there potential for too much obtrusive overlook? Was that dis discussed in putting this together? So uh, the zoning bylaw does contain um, uh, regulations related to projections into yards. So somebody won't be able to, for example, um, cover the entire, or have a balcony project four feet over the side yard. That's not permitted. What is the distance then from the side yard to a potential balcony at, at that height, at the maximum uh, height? Um, I don't exactly remember that, but um, it, it does depend on the, um, on the height of, of, for example, decks and balconies, how high they are from finished grade, but uh, 
I, unfortunately, I don't have that number. I, that's fine. The, yep. the point, I think, is that it is considered that you don't want to have obtrusive overlook, and the setbacks are accordingly to, 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 make, to make sure that doesn't happen. Yes, exactly. And, and if somebody did want to have a balcony on the side, then they would have to have a greater side yard setback to be able to achieve that functional balcony. Perfect. Yep. Excellent. Um, and on coverage, a few more questions about that as it pertains to runoff. Um, will the 30% coverage lead to more runoff, especially if you add the 10% of, say, uh, a side garage? So 40% of a lot could be covered. How is runoff considered in that? So as compared to the existing situation where there is no maximum lot coverage, um, the 30% lot coverage will actually help reduce runoff because it will uh, leave more permeable surface on the um, lot. Excellent. So as rain events become more severe due to climate change, this will actually be a benefit for the neighborhood? Yes. Okay. And then uh, my final line of questioning for right now is about tree coverage in the neighborhood. Could you explain a bit how this bylaw addresses uh, cutting down of trees if a smaller home is demolished for a bigger home? How does the, the natural landscape get affected? Um, the um, destruction or removal of trees is regulated through the tree bylaw, not through the zoning bylaw. Um, and this is something that we cannot regulate through zoning. Um, the tree bylaw does allow, um, it doesn't apply to residential properties. So um, for those type of properties, a tree permit is not required unless the tree is located on, in the municipal road allowance. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Um, just another question about maximum height. So we had some residences this week who emailed us asking if we could amend the bylaw tonight to be 29 feet to 31 feet high, hoping that that would discourage three-story homes. But through correspondence today, it looks like um, even if we did amend it to 31 feet, there could still be three stories. Can you please confirm that? Yes, um, through you, Mr. Chair. Yes, I like I mentioned, I did. I was able to speak with the, one of our building staff regarding that, and they indicated that yes, even with 31 feet, um, somebody could still do three stories by lowering the ceiling heights um, and by having a flat roof. And so, um, one other thing for fair, of all the zoning bylaws, there's just one zoning bylaw, it's Pittsburgh District, that has the, like, a maximum height of 29.5 feet, and all the other zoning is already, like, 34.5, 35, or 36 feet, is that true? Um, through you, Mr. Uh, Chair, uh, yes, that's correct. There are two zones in the Pittsburgh Township bylaw that... Uh, permit a maximum height of nine meters. Um, however, all of the other zones permit 10.5, 10.7, or 11 meters as well. And um, it also depends on how height is defined in each of the zoning bylaws. In some bylaws, height is measured to a mid midpoint of the sloped roof, so which means that dwellings would actually be higher if we were to measure them to the uh, peak of the roof. Thanks. Councillor Hutchison. In the, um, in the consultant's report, and here as well, um, it indicates that you're going to be allowed, um, you can correct me on any of this, 10.75 meters in height, but at each level there's a step back on the first. So the walls, I'm just making sure I understand this, the walls are not going straight up. That's not allowed. They have to be stepped back in order to uh, reduce overlook and uh, intrusion. Is that correct reading of what the what's being proposed here? So um, through you, Mr. Chair, yes, initially when we had the open house more than a year ago, that was one of the initial recommendations to um, have um, any any mass step back above the second story. Um, however, based on feedback received, it, it was uh, mentioned that that 
would not be feasible from, from an actual construction perspective. So uh, that recommendation was then included in the design guidelines instead, instead of being a zoning recommendation. Councillor Chappelle had another question. Yes, thank you, Theory Chair. The city has recently passed a, a, a bylaw about secondary dwelling suites and secondary dwellings, tiny homes, et cetera. Will this proposal, the way it's presented, prevent or preclude um, residents with larger lots from putting a 500 square foot secondary suite in their backyard? Um, uh, through you to chair, second units are required to comply with lot coverage requirements where such requirements have been established in the zoning bylaw. Um, depending, uh, based on the lot sizes in the area, it should not preclude uh, the development of second units. Um, second units are also now permitted in accessory buildings. So it, it should not pre preclude the development of second units, but, but it would also depend on what's already on the lot and the lot size and how much of the uh, lot is already covered by a building. Thank you. Uh, seeing no further questions, could you take the chair? Take the chair. Thank you. Um, just a quick, uh, there was mention of non-conforming non units. Uh, unless you're a planning policy wonk, you may not know what that means. And what that means is that we can't change a bylaw that suddenly puts an existing house into a non-complying status. Um, and that's a sensible bylaw. It does mean that somebody can't buy, if somebody buys the lot, and I know this was a recurring thing in Reddendale, and chooses to demolish the existing home, they can only build, and I'll ask staff to confirm this, because only on Thursday nights am I a planner. So, but uh, they, they have to build within the, per, uh, the measurement of the existing footprint and within the existing envelope, but they can't, uh, they can't suddenly demolish and build a larger if it doesn't already exist. Is that accurate? So, um, so yes, if, if there's, um, sorry, if, if uh, um, an existing building is non-conform, is legal non-conforming, which means that it was legally built in accordance with the provisions of the previous zoning bylaw, it can continue to be used for the purpose it was intended for. If someone wishes to demolish and rebuild, they can build it to the same footprint as existing. Uh, if they wish to expand it, they would need a minor variance application, depending on, um, depending on whether the expansion would affect any, any of the zoning um, regulations. If not, then it would not need a variance. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hill. Would that in include uh, swimming pools, patios, other kinds of uses uh, uh, beyond sort of the dwelling itself? So for example, if there's currently a pool that's, that's you know, in the ribbon of life, would they be able to rebuild that pool? Through you, Mr. Chair, um, yes. Uh, however, I would like to say um, there are also CRCA regulations that apply, and I cannot speak to those regulations, but based on zoning, yes. Thank you. Sorry, I keep sneaking a peek at my phone here. Uh, so, uh, seeing no further questions, I'll now open this to the public. Uh, there are microphones here and a microphone over here. Uh, we'll start at this side. If you just go to a mic and uh, give your name and address, that would be great. So, yes, just move right up to a microphone and so you can go first, and I'll recognize this gentleman. Any of these mics along the front? Uh, this is your only opportunity to speak to this before a decision is made. Right. 
turn this. Whoop. My name is George Weens. I live at 39 Crearwire Boulevard in Point Pleasant. A brief bit of background. In December 2017, Council approved a budget of $100,000 for a study of the zoning bylaw for the Reddendale area. Dillon Consulting was hired to conduct this study. A working group was also formed consisting of city staff and community members to consider the issues, and this group was active during 2018. In October 2018, Dillon Consulting presented its recommendations regarding the zoning bylaw for the Reddendale area. The Dillon report was presented in a public meeting, which was widely advertised by the city to provide opportunity for citizen input. Their recommendations included the following. Lot frontage, 65 feet. Rear yard, 25 feet minimum. Height of the building, 32 feet. Lot coverage maximum, 30%. Floor, floor space index, 0.4 above grade. Front yard setback, various options. Side yard setback, six feet. In that public meeting, there was very little opposition to the ideas presented. In March 2019, the City Planning Department, after studying the Dillon Report, presented the following recommendations. Lot frontage 55 feet, as opposed to the Dillon 65. Rear yard 25 feet minimum, or equivalent to the height of the rear house wall. Height of building 35 feet, Dillon had recommended 32. Lot coverage 30% of the lot area. Floor space index 0.35, all floors above and below grade. Front yard setback 20 feet and consider the setbacks of adjacent properties. Side yard setback six feet. These recommendations were considered by the planning department to be appropriate for our area. On April 24, 2019, a public meeting was held at City Hall inviting input regarding the recommendations of the planning department. By this time, many more citizens and developers in the area had become involved. At this meeting, opposition was expressed, especially concerning the floor space index proposal, including basements in the calculation, and more generally, to the idea of restrictions on house size. The opposition was quite animated, to say the least. In view of that opposition, and as I perceive it only because of that opposition, the report of the planning department was sent back for further consideration. The recommendations were revised, eliminating all but two of the previous recommendations. The new report from the planning department was published in July for a public meeting scheduled for August 15, delayed until today. The report now on the table presents only two changes from the status quo, that is, the way things are today a lot coverage limit of 30% and a redefinition of established grade. Only one recommendation from the Dillon Report was adopted, namely the lot coverage limit. This one recommendation is the net result of $48,000 spent on the Dillon Report and as we understand, 52,000 allocated to staff salaries for work on the project. This begs the question as to the effectiveness of employing a consultant with taxpayers' funds if the results are so limited and the consultant's recommendations are set aside. 
$100,000 is a heavy price to pay for one change in the box. please. 30 seconds remaining. Thank you. I am requesting the report of the Planning Department be sent back with directives to reinstate a floor space index excluding basement as well as the Dillon recommended setbacks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we gather all of the questions and they're answered uh, by uh, staff at the end of this. And this gentleman is doing the correct thing. If you have, have a PowerPoint that's already been put on, definitely you can go to the podium uh, to present. Uh, I'm James Stewart at 46 Park Crescent. So Mr. Weens has covered much of the history. Um, things started falling apart when the FSI of 0.35, including basement, was introduced because that rendered a lot of houses non-conforming. And so there was quite rightly a, a lot of negative feedback about that. Uh, during the subsequent open house, there was a poll by using a phone app and later uh, emailed uh, votes came in, and there was also uh, email collected by the uh, planning department after that. And on the basis of that, the planning department decided that there was a lack of consensus. And so the question is, uh, was there really a lack of consensus? And uh, I ask because polls like this, or polls like the one at the meeting there, tend to be biased, and emails that you get in tend to come from people who are on either side of the spectrum, who are very vocal about what they want. So the only way to really determine whether uh, there was a lack of consensus is to conduct an unbiased poll of the whole neighborhood. And so there is a professional polling consultant in our neighborhood, and he helped our group set a form, uh, build a set of unbiased questions. He helped manage the survey and analyze the results. We sent out letters to all the homes in Redendale. Each had a unique code, so each home could essentially participate once. Uh, participation was very strong. We had uh, 93, it's actually 100 now, but the statistics remain the same. We had 93 people, uh, unique responses from across Redendale. On one side there was uh, uh, Lakeland Point Drive and on the other was Point Crescent. So this is very representative of what Redendale thinks, not just the vocal people, but everybody. So the results, okay. Um, established grade. So. Uh, the established grade is the two points at the front rather than the built-up uh, land. And the established grade idea had uh, very strong support. It was overwhelmingly favored. Um, this is like more than five to one ratio like this thing. And this is good because the planning department included this in the current report. Second thing was square footage of the house. We asked people about square footage instead of FSI because people have a better intuition about the square footage of their own home and they have an intuition for the houses on their own street and what they think should be the maximum square footage on their own street. And so we asked this question, and most people said about 3,000. The uh, average within Ontario for a single detached home is about 2,400. And there were 13 people who essentially asked for no limit on the square footage. Everybody else wanted a limit of up to 4,000. Most was uh, 3,000 or 3,500. These people on the top wanted a limit. The 13 there did not want a limit. And so if you take the people who want a limit and compare them to the people who uh, don't want a limit, excluding the uh, undecided voters, as it were, uh, you get 84% of people in, who responded who want a limit on the square footage. It's not necessarily FSI or square footage. It may be related to how many floors are in your house, but they want a limit. Again, this is overwhelmingly favored within Redendale. Five, more than five to one. If you uh, got votes like this, you know, you'd be laughing, right? So, uh, next question was uh, three stories. Um, before I say this, my main point is that if 84% is sufficient for established grade, then 84% should also be sufficient for uh, some limit on the, on the square footage. Going on to three stories. Uh, three stories were uh, not overwhelmingly favored, but strongly favored uh, with 76%. People wanted to forbid three stories. Uh, the average front setback, uh, if the uh, house is protruding too much, it blocks the sight lines. And so people uh, favored strongly that the houses be set back an average of the adjacent houses or an average with a limit. 
There are other questions. 67% um, 60, favored a six foot uh, side setback instead of, 30, uh, instead of uh, four feet. Um, they wanted the idea of having a rear setback a little bit more for, for high homes and a 65 foot frontage. So this survey is essentially the first hard data that we have on the opinions in Redendale. It's got high participation, it covers Redendale broadly, um, and so it shows also that this lack of consensus, this perception of lack of consensus, is not correct. Okay, there's strong or overwhelming support for many aspects of the original proposal. So in light of these survey results, I respectfully ask that the planning committee refer the report back to reinstate at least some of these aspects, including the square footage, be it FSI or whatever, and average setback. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Uh, other members of the public? Great. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Enid Henwood, and I am, my husband and I reside at 34 Quira Boulevard in Point Pleasant. Three years ago, next door to our home, on the property formerly known as 60 Park Crescent, stood a two-story 1950s-style family home and garage set amongst well-established trees and shrubbery. Unfortunately, in later years, it had come into disrepair. Once in the hands of a contractor, the house was demolished and the property severed. Today, this property still contains three very large houses with one more still to be built. The result will be four homes, all in the space of where one home once stood. To the neighborhood's dismay, all the mature trees have been cut down and much of the shrubbery have been pulled out. The most recent build of these homes is a towering three-story square box. From its 12 sets of windows and doors on the rear of the house, every one of them affords the owners a full view of our backyard. From nowhere in our rear yard are we not overlooked. This constitutes a total invasion of our privacy and reduces the customary enjoyment and comfort of our own property. We can't help but feel that we are being gazed upon whether that is the case or not. Section 2.7 of the City of Kingston official plan deals with land use compatibility and states its goal is, in short, to ensure compatibility development and land use in order to avoid or mitigate adverse effect. According to section 2.7.3, the compatibility matters to be considered, among others, are shadowing, loss of privacy due to intrusive overlook, and environmental damage or degradation. It seems that these matters were totally dismissed in this particular recent build. I therefore ask the committee to recommend that the planning department reconsider the maximum height of new buildings from the present 35 feet that allows buildings like this to a reduced height that will ensure no further three-story homes are built and others in the neighborhood do not have their privacy invaded as we do. Thank you. Thank you. Technical issues. If there's another member of the public that wants to grab a microphone, uh, please do, and we'll just get this next presentation set up. Thank you. Hey, my name is Bernard Steglich. I'm living 154 Lakeshore Boulevard. <clears throat> I would like to address the issue about uh, 30% foot coverage and uh, detached versus attached garage. Up to now, uh, I understood, okay, it's 30%. Yes, that sounded all right to me, 10,000 square foot average. That means the footprint of a building is 3,000 square foot. Now, 
maybe I didn't do my homework, but today I fully recognize more just now that a 10 foot, 10% detached garage can be added. That's a total of 1,000 square foot. So when we always see about 30% coverage, now suddenly, to me, it is 40%. What does that mean, 1,000 square foot? What's, are there any limitations about the lengths, the widths, the heights? Can it be connected, for example, to a passage to the house? So, and is that addressed in the zoning bylaws or the design criteria? I have not looked for that particularly, but it would be interesting to know. So, the summary about this is, initially, it's not 3,000, uh, 30%. My interpretation is 40%. So my suggestion is to have an action item to look at the implications, what that means, what uh, further investigation need to be done, uh, layouts and uh, possible discussions with the, us, the neighborhood, what, what impact that has. Can, the, can this... Uh, garage, be on the side, behind, and whatever. I don't have the answers here, obviously, but uh, it occurred to me that it should be investigated because it potentially has significant impact. Could I ask you your name? Uh, My name is Bernard the, the Steglitch. Bernard Steglitch, 154 Lakeshore Boulevard. Thank you very much. And the floor is yours. Technology never works, so I need it too. Uh, my name is Petra McDowell. I'm a resident in Redondale, and I second the concerns of my neighbors this evening. Uh, but I would like to ask you to examine the issue from a slightly different perspective. In March of this year, this council declared a climate emergency with the stated purpose of, and I quote, deepening our commitment to protecting our community, our ecosystems, um, and our economy from climate change. I believe that now is the time to act. The issue of climate change is very pertinent to my neighborhood, where we are seeing the direct consequences of high lake water levels, and we're also dealing with an increase in ground and surface water runoff, which has resulted in the flooding of our homes. We are requesting bylaws to better manage the development in our neighborhood, and I would like to show you that these bylaws could easily result in a more environmentally conscious development. In the past two years, there has been a surge number of, in the number of oversized homes that are being built in Redondale. These photos are just two of the many examples of the recent development, with multiple oversized homes being built, where small single homes surrounded by trees once stood. Please note the size of the older homes surrounding the new infill. These oversized homes are vastly inc incompatible with the declared climate emergency. In fact, in the US, it is now recognized that new single-family home construction is one of the most environmentally burdensome of all the economic sectors. And when these homes happen to be oversized, the environmental burden increases. This is because the bigger the home, the more land is necessarily used and thus not available for trees, plants, or animals. The bigger the home, the more impermeable surface is created, which contributes to flooding. The bigger the home, the more resources are needed to build it. So for example, a 2,000 square foot family home is estimated to use just under 14,000 feet of framing lumber, 11,500 square feet of sheathing, and almost 17 tons of concrete. What's more, a 5,000 square foot home will consume three times as many materials. So the relationship between house size and material use is not linear. All of these resources, as well as the manpower, need to be transported to the building location from the places where they are manufactured. That's a lot of CO2. And then, of course, the bigger the home, the more energy is required to heat, cool, and cool the house over the lifetime. And some of these houses will be here for 100 years or more. Therefore, the environmental impact of the homes that you approve today will continue long after we are all gone. Now the new homes are certainly better insulated and they have better windows, but the data shows that the sheer size of the house wipes out nearly all of these efficiency gains. 
Due to the concerns around maintaining the character of the neighborhood and due to environmental concerns, there are now a growing number of municipalities that have put restrictions on the size of the homes that can be built. An example is Chilmark in Massachusetts, where in 2013 they restricted the size of the houses to 3,500 square feet. Understandably, people were upset and concerned that the restriction would result in them not being able to build new homes profitably and that their property values would decrease. But in a full review of the impact of these size restrictions in February 2018, they actually found that the number of building permits issued remained stable and that house prices have increased. There are now many other small and large cities that have followed suit and the number continues to grow. As such, it seems that restricting the size of new builds in established communities is not only desirable and environmentally responsible, but it does not have an impact on the number of new builds and actually has a positive impact on property values. As members of the planning committee, you are in a position to act and to make a significant change. You can ensure that the development in Kingston is environmentally conscious while also being context sensitive. The proposed bylaw amendments in front of you fall short of achieving this. I ask you to return this report back to the planning department and respectfully instruct them to use the results of the Dillon study as the basis for drafting more effective bylaws to govern the future development in Redendale, while keeping in, in mind the importance of the character of the neighborhood, as well as the environmental impact of all new build. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm about to recognize all the people at my back. I apologize, we haven't gotten to that side of the room yet, so. Should I go ahead? Yes. Okay, thank you. My name is Anna O'Reardon. I live at Two Lakeshore Boulevard. I'm a very happy resident of Redendale. My husband and I have lived there for 20 years. We left for nine years after originally moving there when we were first married and lived for seven years and we could hardly wait to get back. This is a compilation of information from myself and from Joanne Robin, who's presenting later. We understood from the planning department that there was a lack of consensus among re residents in Redendale, and that created a lot of changes to the original recommendations from the Dillon report. So Joanne took it upon herself to look at the correspondence that the public had access to that were received by the city's planning department and planning committee to see what kind of, of themes emerged from that. So that's what this is about. Um, we found that there really was a fairly strong consensus among the neighborhood and that residents who did express concerns focused on three areas with requests for further input and consideration. Joanne uh, realized that there were over 125 pieces of correspondence. I understand that's gone up a little bit in recent days. Um, but she looked at 80 contributions meaning they were all from separate households as opposed to multiple letters from the same household or person. There were three letters received from non-residents of Redendale which were not included in, in this review. So in looking at all of the public correspondence available, Joanne was able to determine that there were four categories of responses. The first being neutral, I need help understanding. Second being negative, when does my building permit application have to be in to be able to avoid the new regulations? Many were positive, but with qualifications. My only objection is in including the basement in the FSI calculation and those that were positive. It can't happen fast enough. Please put in place more restrictive zoning to preserve the character of the neighborhood. In looking at the numbers attached to each of these categories, 13 were found to be neutral, 16 to be negative, 12 were positive with qualifications, and 39 were positive. If we exclude the neutral category, the negative comments added up to 23.9%. The positive comments with qualifications were 17.9%, and the purely positive comments were 58.2%. 
So the generally positive comments about the initial recommendations from the Dillon report, Joanne found in her review were 76.1% versus 23.9 negative. The things that people were most concerned about had to do with the FSI, and again, as has been mentioned, people were confused about the FSI, certainly I was, particularly when it was discussing basements to be included and when the result classified houses as legal non-conforming. Many residents have expressed a desire for the average lot frontage to be consistent with the majority of the existing lots in order to prevent smaller lots in the area and recognizing that lots who currently have the right to sever, which are those that are at 110 feet or plus uh, of lot frontage, should retain that right through a grandfathering clause. Some residents continue to perceive that 30% lot coverage is on the low side, and I think that related to attached garages versus detached garages. Joanne noted that only 12 of the 67 households represented expressed a desire to scrap the recommendations made by the Dillon Consulting and Planning Department in March of 2019. We suggest that consensus is ideal, that positive compromise is within our reach, and additional collaboration is required to attain an outcome agreeable to the majority of Redendale residents. I ask that the Planning Committee return the current proposal to the Planning Department. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, Is there somebody on this side that would like to speak? If you want to grab this mic right here and just push the button. Uh, in the middle, that would be great. Thank you. And I'll let you begin. And when the clerk's back at the end, if you can give your name and address. Sure, no problem. Thank you. Yeah, it's just for me. I'm a relatively new resident to Reddendale. So I don't have a lot to say about the report by itself. I understand a lot of things that are already in there. My major concern relates to the waterfront setback. Um, I'm troubled that there, you can't do anything in that 100-foot setback, that you can't do something in there uh, with respect to a patio. What, what does a patio look like? There's things that you can do with the creativity with respect to stonework and that sort of thing. I think you, you don't want to put decks up that don't look uh, aren't attractive or that um, uh, take away from the, the value of that property. But to leave that just a fallow ground, I, I, I find that a little troubling. I'd like to be able to do something there that I can use that front part of that property at least to some extent. So I'd like at least some consideration of what I can do to actually use some part of that 100-foot easement at the front of the property. The other thing that I have to say that concerns me a little bit, with a 100-foot setback, why the Cataraqui Regional Conservation Authority, when they do their assessment and they have an opinion on how far back a property should be built, why that would not be uh, taken as a, as a good guideline for where a property might be built, why we're taking a 100-foot setback or, or 30-meter setback if the Conservation Authority has something else that might be less than that setback, why we wouldn't consider their opinion when they've done their survey why that wouldn't be an appropriate setback rather than setting it as 100 foot. So I'd like to understand a little more about that, why that wouldn't be something that would be considered. Uh, the other thing that I was thinking about, being a, a new purchaser, I'm, I'm one of the ones that are buying a lot. I don't want to build a gigantic home, but I'd like to build a nice home that's usable on the piece of property that I purchased. Um, I feel like I'm being forced to build a detached garage to build a reasonable home and I don't understand why the way it's being set up, that that's something that I have to consider in the way that I would like to design a home that I want to build. Those are the only things that I have to do, that I, comments I wanted to make. And my name is Kent Elliott, and I've just purchased a property at number four, Lakeshore Boulevard. Thank you. And back to the podium. Um, Mr. Chairman and members of the Planning Committee, um, I'd like to first start just by thanking you all for listening to us again, and um, in particular for the interest that you've already shown in all your questions, which clearly indicate that you're really up on this issue, so thank you. 
I wanted to, just at the beginning to go back to why this whole thing started. And the entire study was a quest to determine the character of Reddendale and how to allow new development that would complement it. The character of Reddendale is based largely on green space, separation between houses, and context-sensitive positioning of houses on lots that would not create overlook or crowding. Consensus on the character of the neighborhood is comprehensive and wide-ranging. Is Reddendale a substantially different neighborhood than others, such as Henderson Place and LaSalle Park? That question has come up several times. No, it's not. It's simply more ripe for development. And what is happening there now will follow in those other subdivisions in due course. Reddendale is merely at the forefront. One obvious way to ensure complementary development is to restrict the parameters of new development to ensure that it fits in in a reasonable manner, which basically means size and shape. Most redevelopments in the area have demonstrated consideration of crowding and overlook, but some have not. They have taken a very laissez-faire attitude to earn extra profit for themselves. Few though they are, they have taken great advantage of the neighborhood and are causing it to become a victim of its own success. They move in and destroy what they are exploiting. The original recommendations of Dillon Consulting were designed to stop these unwanted intrusions as much as is reasonable. Evidence and analysis presented by the community, James and Anne and myself, support or demonstrate overwhelming support for Dillon's original recommendations and some of those initiated by the city and presented in March to the community at large. Most of the objections to those recommendations are based on either misinformation or on the assumption that they are insurmountable and that common ground is not attainable. I am a strong believer that this is not the case. The confusion that exists, due mainly to misinformation, can be cleared up. Further negotiation and discussion among parties with vested interests can bring about consensus-based recommendations which will ensure compatibility of the existing builds and proposals for new developments, and also ensure the overall quality of the location and environment. To date, $50,000 has been spent on this study. But it's, as it stands at the moment, I can honestly say that very few people are happy with the recommendations as they are. I urge the planning committee to direct the planning department to either collect more data regarding what the residents want and or to aid in negotiations between different factions and find a more consensual and defensible position. A few more dollars spent on this study will prevent many future challenges to redevelop sorry, to redevelopment over many years. 30 seconds, please. Consensus planning is the way forward, but more work is needed to get there. Thank you. Thank you. Any further members of the public wish to speak? Yes, go right ahead. Uh, Martin Mack, I am a builder and a resident. Basically, I did not participate in the survey that was put around. Um, a little unhappy with the survey that there was a counselor associated with it. Um, I think that's something that needs to be looked at a little deeper. I have a couple questions and a few statements about um, lot coverage. Um, 
the, I think James did his presentation, the average uh, square footage, which most people agreed, was around the 3,000 mark. Basically with a, a garage, um, that is not attainable with 30%. I think the lot coverage should be 40. Why not just make it 40 right across the board? You're doing 30 for the house, 10 for a detached garage. You should just go 40 for either or. Um, and the other thing I would like everyone to think about is, and I've made this comment to the planning department is, lot coverage, and I know Reddendale is not a new subdivision. New subdivisions in areas, lot coverage is 40 to 45%. I think the councillor here asked that question. Um, and that is a higher percentage on a smaller lot. These are larger lots. And I've, I've mentioned that to the planning department several times. And basically, they say, well, it's a smaller lot. Well, smaller lot, and you're giving them a higher percentage of lot coverage, which makes no sense whatsoever. So again, I, I think the 40% should be right across the board as a lot coverage, um, and that we really think about that. 30% is not enough, and I, I think that survey really showed that the average is 3,000, and that doesn't include the porch, the garage, so 40% would be a good number. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, turning to my, uh, anybody wish to continue? Okay, um, I'm gonna go to this side, then I'll come back to this side, because we've really been concentrating. My sight lines are on the, in that direction, so go right ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Frank Dixon. 495 Alfred, apartment two, K7K, 4J4. So I don't live in the neighborhood. I have some friends who live there and I've been following the file for the last couple of years on this. And I follow planning matters pretty closely uh, in the city. So at, at a couple of points, um, one of them is to do with the shoreline issues and this might be a question for city staff um, as well as the, um, the presenters on this and council. In April of this year, there was a report presented by city staff to the Environment Committee dealing with shore issues which was prompted by flooding in 2017. And we saw flooding also in 2019. So here's my question. Um, what are the specifics from that report as they apply to the Reddendale neighborhood? So there might be a complex answer, perhaps not available tonight, but I think it's uh, worth examining because as climate change is coming in, we may see more extreme weather events and that might mean more flooding. So I think it's good to study that. There's work that's been done. And then my second question carries on from information presented already from one of the presenters tonight with respect to the funding um, created uh, through a grant of council um, for $100,000. Excuse me, uh, if I could just uh, interrupt for a minute. We should be focusing on land use planning. The Planning Act is very specific. We don't, uh, and it, I may share some issues with the concept of, of how the study was funded, but that's a totally different question than the land use planning questions that we need to focus on in the, in the report. Um, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I may just um, that it's already been raised. Speakers, and I'm, not, I'm a citizen as well, so and I'm, I'm, and we should have uh, politely interrupted that other speaker as well, and I don't think there was a lot of time spent on that. So, if people have questions about how the study was funded, then we sh you should make those through the CAO or through the uh, city, city clerk or through your district councillor. But we shouldn't be talking about things not related and the Planning Committee is quasi-judicial, and we're governed by the Planning Act. And the Planning Act is very specific. We don't talk about tenancy. We don't 
wander off into other areas. So if you could keep, keep focused on, on that. And all of my time hasn't eaten into your time, I want you to know. Thank you. So I will follow up and, um, and I'll make it available to uh, all of the council as well as this committee on this point. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, go ahead. Okay, my name is Chris Boot. My business partner and I own six properties in Redendale. We do not reside there, but we do own properties and pay taxes in the area. Um, this survey that went around, um, I contacted them about it, and I, I mentioned to them that you know we do have these properties, and I was told that as a non-resident, my my opinions or my answers to the survey would be would be put down as a non-resident. Again, that was not a city survey, and but, we've heard that yeah. criticism, and I appreciate that you've made that criticism, okay. but we need to talk about land use planning issues that are before okay. us, That's, if you would. Okay. Thank you. So, I don't, I don't have a, a lot of the stuff, well, with the way the study or the proposals are coming out right now, it's unfortunate so much money was spent on this whole thing. And my problem with it is, is that I do agree that it should be a 40% right off the get-go for, for uh, lot coverage. Um, the other thing is, I'm not sure how it is that the city is going to ascertain what the new high water mark is uh, with the changes in the in the current flooding, et cetera, that we've been experiencing over the last couple of years. What I do take offense to is the fact that there's even mention of guidelines in this proposal. There's, I don't feel that it should be anybody's right to tell me what it is I am going to build. When I put up, uh, when I build a brand new house, or whatever it is I do, it is for the betterment of the community, and I'm not going to build something that looks horrible. When I go through the subdivision right now, there's a lot of places I'm I'm afraid that don't meet any of the guidelines that the city per, that they are proposing. So I think that if that was removed entirely from any proposal, I'd be much happier with this. That and I don't and, and I don't agree with the thirty percent lot coverage. Thank you. Thank you. I believe there's a gentleman right here that. We... There, okay. So my name is Neil Scott, and I live at uh, Twenty Nine Jorine Drive, and I'm uh, actually work in the Department of Geography and Planning at Queens. Um, I just want to review a little bit about the process. Um, some of this has been touched on tonight, uh, and I'll be very short. January 2018, Council approved um, $100,000 to investigate the issue of infill development in Redendale. One of the goals that was stipulated at that time was, quote, development of a zoning framework specific to Redendale to achieve the desired character of residential buildings. The city retained Dillon Consultants, as we've heard, uh, to explore this issue, Dylan went through a highly consultative process through a series of public meetings, working with community groups. All of those were open to anybody who wanted to participate. It was a very open and transparent process. Dylan Consulting did what they were supposed to do. They took the public input and they prepared a series of recommendations, uh, many of which have been removed from the current proposal uh, in front of the planning committee. The current recommendations are based on this assessment. There's no consensus of opinion about the, the terms that were stipulated in the um, proposed bylaw back in March of 2019. This no consensus is really based on public comments from after that March meeting, but also at the April uh, 2019 meeting as well. But we don't really know how representative those opinions are. And I think what we've heard tonight is a lot of information suggesting that uh, there is generally broad support for a lot of these changes that were included in the Dillon report initially and which have been taken out in the current proposal. Many of the people who were in favor of some of these changes were actually at some of those early meetings and may have kind of lost interest and not continued to be engaged, and that may reflect some of the, the fact that uh, perhaps those opinions weren't heard as strongly later in the process. Bylaws and any laws are... Um, 
made by elected, elect, elected officials uh, are not always based on consensus of public opinion. Sometimes elected officials have to make hard decisions um, to appeal for a greater good, such as protecting and preserving communities. Um, my example that I have is, would we allow manufacturing industries to develop our drinking water standards? No, we don't do that. <laughs> but if we're going to let public consensus influence our zoning bylaws, we need to have an unbiased assessment of a public opinion. Uh, compiling written comments does not necessarily uh, reflect this sort of unbiased approach to gathering information. The survey results presented, presented tonight by Mr. Stewart, I think, that canvassed the entire neighborhood uh, and showed strong support for many of those conditions that were laid out in the initial bylaw that was proposed in March. So I encourage the planning committee to complete the process they set out to do send this proposal back to the planning department to incorporate some of the majority opinions that were reflected in the initial uh, report prepared by Dillon Consultants. And I'd also encourage them to do it quickly because the longer we wait to get anything done, the more development and the more building occurs in that area. So because nothing really will change uh, until a bylaw is passed. So I would just encourage us to do that or encourage you to do that as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any further comments? from this side of the room. Any further comments from this side of the room? I feel like an auctioneer. Going, going, gone. Uh, so we will give staff an opportunity to respond to those comments or, or particularly any questions that came up. Then we'll come back into the committee uh, for Brief question opportunity, and then we'll put the motion on the floor for a vote. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you to, um, to all members of the public who have uh, provided us with comments tonight. Um, I am going to try and address the comments to the best of my ability. Um, several of the comments um, focused on the original recommendations from Dylan and, um, and that uh, many of the, those recommendations have not been carried forward in the um, recommendations that are presented tonight. So I just wanted to um, go over uh, the process in general um, in, in, um, in greater detail. So. Um, as I mentioned, this work stemmed from a motion of council um, uh, from December 17th of 2017, which asked staff to look at the feasibility of establishing uh, a zoning framework that was specific to Redendale um, to address infill development in the area and to ensure that new development is um, compatible with the existing character of the area. Um, in response to this council motion, staff presented a scope of work, um, which was approved by council in January of 2018. And following this, a community working group was established in March of 2018. Um, work started on this project in uh, April of 2018 alongside Dillon Consulting Limited. Um, staff held several meetings um, over the summer of 2018 with Dillon Consulting and with the working group members to develop some initial zoning recommendations for the Redendale area. Um, and um, the recommendations were um, generally based on the feedback that was received from um, the six working group members. Um, at that time, it was indicated to them that the recommendations may change when the recommendations are presented to the broader public. Um, to receive feedback on those initial recommendations, an open house was held in October of 2018, um, at which time um, several comments were received in support of those recommendations um, and also uh, not in support of the recommendations, and several comments received were related to generally um, stormwater management and flooding in the area. That is because the timing of this study overlapped with uh, a stormwater study that was being conducted by the city for this area. Um, based on the feedback that was received at that public meeting, staff presented refined, rec uh, refined recommendations 
or a re refined zoning um, recommendation, recommendations at a public meeting in March of 2019. Um, since that meeting, staff received a number of comments that were uh, both in support of those recommendations and against the recommendations. So based on the feedback received, staff held another open house in um, April of 2014, uh, sorry, in April of 2019, um, where we presented um, um, the zoning recommendations in more detail using graphics, um, and there was also a survey conducted at that open house. Um, uh, which, which provided instant results. Uh, paper copies of the survey were also provided to those individuals who could not participate in the survey using a mobile phone or a tablet. Um, all of the input received throughout this process was uh, compiled by staff and considered as part of this work. And based on the feedback received, staff have, staff have further refined the zoning recommendations that have been presented tonight. Um, so um, I'm going to now try and address some of the um, other correspondence, um, uh, sorry, comments that have been received tonight um, as it relates to um, the FSI recommendation that is no longer being proposed. Uh, staff received a number of comments related to the FSI that was proposed at the public meeting, which was 0.35, um, including the basement. Uh, m several members of the community did not feel that that number or using the FSI concept was appropriate for the area. Uh, whereas we also received several comments in support of the FSI. However, uh, some comments indicated that the FSI number should be greater. Um, Comments were made about um, about how how these proposed zoning bylaw amendments address uh, com compatibility matters. Uh, the proposed lot coverage is 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 a big change that is being proposed for this area. Currently, like I mentioned, there is no lot coverage requirement. Uh, properties can be developed up to up to approximately um, 65 percent. Um, 30% is required for landscape open space, and I'm just leaving approximately 5% for driveways. Um, so, so, so that 30% is a considerable reduction in the amount of, uh, of building footprint can, that can be constructed on a lot, um, um, which, which, which in our opinion does uh, address a lot of uh, issues around the character of the area and also compatibility um, of new development with existing development in the area. Um, comments were made regarding uh, reconsidering the maximum height of new buildings within the neighborhood. Um, as I had mentioned in response to a previous um, comment, uh, at this time staff are not recommending changes to the maximum height. However, changes are being proposed with respect to how height is measured, and that will have an impact on um, reducing the height of uh, existing, uh, of sorry, of new buildings in the in the neighborhood. Um, there was a comment regarding 30% uh, lot coverage for the dwelling, and 10% uh, lot coverage for uh, detached accessory buildings. Uh, the zoning bylaw already includes um, lot coverage requirements of 10% for a detached accessory building. That requirement is not proposed to be changed. Um, this is also, um, uh, in, also in line with the second unit's amendments that the city has recently uh, made because uh, having 10% uh, lot coverage devoted to an accessory building, could that, that area could be used as a detached second unit. Um, yes, that's correct that uh, ap approximately 40% of um, the lot can, can now be covered by a building, but as compared to existing where approximately 65% uh, can be covered by a built area, it, it's, it's still a big reduction. Uh, there was a comment made whether or not an attached garage could be connected um, uh, by a passage to the house. If, if it is connected, then it, it's considered part of the main dwelling and, and the 30% lot coverage would apply in that case. 
Um, there was a comment made about um, flooding, uh, about oversized homes being built in the area. Um, uh, uh, the city has conducted a separate study as it relates to flooding and stormwater management in the area which is outside of the um, scope of this work. Um, regarding restricting, restricting sizes of new homes, the 30% lot coverage is intended to achieve just that. Um, um, there was a comment about the 30 meter or the 100 feet setback from the high water mark. Uh, for um, development along the waterfront uh, and why the CRCA's regulations are not taken as a guideline. The, the 30 meter setback was, uh, has been in place in the city's official plan since, since 2010. Um, through the recent five year update of the city's official plan, um, the city um, underwent uh, more consultation with the Ministry of Municipal Affairs uh, with the Ministry of the Environment and the Cataraqui Region Conservation Authority as it relates to the 30 meter setback. Um, the um, several other municipalities across Ontario also have this requirement of, um, of, of leaving a 30 meter naturalized buffer along the shoreline. Um, the, any zoning bylaw that is passed by a municipality must uh, conform with the policies of the official plan. And as such, since the official plan already contains uh, policies as it relates to a minimum 30 meter setback from the high water mark, this has been uh, built into the proposed zoning bylaw amendment for the Red and Dale area. Uh, the CRCA does have its own guidelines. The CRCA's guidelines also recommend a 30 meter setback. Um, the CRCA already also has requirements as it relates to floodplain setbacks in the area. Um, based on the floodplain mapping, we know that floodplain in this area in some locations actually extends beyond 30 meters from the shoreline. Um, uh, there was a comment made about um, lot coverage that it should be increased to 40%. Uh, and that in new subdivisions, typically 42, 45% has been used as the uh, maximum lot coverage. Um, as I, as I uh, had previously mentioned, um, lots in the Redendale area are larger than the new subdivisions that are being put in place. So taking that into consideration, uh, a maximum lot coverage of 30% is being proposed for this area. The average lot size in Redendale is 3,000 uh, sorry, 10,000 square feet. At 30%, somebody, someone could build a house with uh, a ground floor of 3,000 square feet. Um, so um, as such, it was, it was determined that a 30% lot coverage was, uh, was acceptable for this area. The minimum lot size that is permitted in the R1-3 zone is 6,000 square feet. Um, like I said, the average lots are about 10,000 square feet in the area. There are a few lots that are at 6,000 square feet. For those lots at 30% lot coverage, um, 1,800 square, foot, square feet could be achieved on the ground floor level. Um, there was a comment made about a previous report to the um, environmental to the um, EITP committee about shoreline issues and uh, whether there were any specifics from that report that were um, considered for this work um, as it relates to weather events and climate change. Um, that report was not considered. However, um, the 30 meter setback from the high water mark for new development along shoreline, uh, along the Lake Ontario shoreline, is intended to address in part um, climate change. It is a climate change buffer as well, as well as the 30% 30 30 lot coverage is also uh, intended to, which will indirectly address issues related to stormwater management by reducing the footprint of buildings that are on um, these lots. Um, There was also a comment made about how the high watermark is measured. 
um, based on the um, recent high water levels and the fluctuation in the high water levels. Um, staff did consult with the uh, Cataraqui Region Conservation Authority with respect to the measurement of high water mark and um, um, they indicated that um, typically um, it's, it's the physical mark that is left on the shoreline by the long term annual high water level which typically uh, occurs during the spring. So there may be times when uh, water levels are higher, there may be times when water levels are lower. However, typically speaking, we would look at the uh, physical mark that's left on the shoreline. And this is typically determined by staff uh, from the Conservation Authority. Um, there was um, a question from, um, um, from Councillor Chappelle regarding um, the number of non-conforming uh, waterfront lots as a result of this um, zoning bylaw amendment. Um, there are approximately 85 uh, waterfront lots of which approximately 26 would become non-conforming. Um, now this is just based on mapping. Uh, staff haven't looked at exactly where that high watermark is, but just approximately this, this would be about 30% of the lots that would uh, become non-conforming because of uh, the proposed amendments. Um, I just wanted to add that um, the separate stormwater analysis being um, uh, spearheaded by the engineering department, um, uh, they, they had retained WSP to undertake that review and that, that work was also considered as part of this work. Um, um, and the 30% lot coverage is intended to address stormwater management as well. Um, uh, there was also a question about uh, the location of accessory buildings on the lot um, and, and the height of those buildings. So the zoning bylaw permits a maximum height of 15 feet for detached accessory buildings on a lot. These type of buildings are only permitted to be located in the rear yard or in the interior side yard. Um, and, they and they are required to have a minimum setback of four feet from the side lot line and the rear lot line. Um, there was um, also a comment by uh, uh, Councillor Kylie regarding um, balconies and how much they can project into the side yard. Um, I left, I've looked into the bylaw and uh, the bylaw requires that a minimum side yard setback for the main building applies to balconies as well. So, uh, so they would have to be at least four feet from the side lot line. They can extend uh, 3.5 meters into the front yard, um, and they can extend up to two meters into the rear yard, but they cannot extend greater than what the side yard setback is for the main dwelling into the side yard. Um, there were also comments made about um, sending the proposal back to staff, and um, that would be um, in the hands of planning committee. I cannot comment on that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hill, uh, we've now gone back into committee. Um, at the very beginning, we should speak only to questions, but once the motion is on the floor, we can make comments and ask further questions if we wish. So, did you have a question or no? So, I'm looking for a mover and a shaker for the, thank you, Councillor Hill, and uh, moving and a seconder, uh, Councillor Asanik. Uh, it's now open to the committee uh, to make comments. Go right ahead. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So, my, <clears throat> I inherited this file from my predecessor, Laura Turner, and I'm sure I'll find an opportunity to thank her in the near future. My first interaction with residents around this zoning bylaw was last October, and quite frankly, I believe that the primary focus was on water management as opposed to planning. 
Very early on, it appeared to me that the general consensus was that the vast majority of residents desired to protect and promote the, neighbor, uh, the nature of the neighbourhood as it existed. For me, I could understand this sentiment, although I didn't grow up in Reddale, but rather in Henderson Place. I spent a lot of my youth in this area and I played with the children of working class families who lived there. It was most assuredly a working class neighbourhood. And so I could understand their desire to protect it not only for themselves, but for future generations of similar families who would like to live there. So the first set of recommendations presented by Dylan resulted in a great deal of concern being expressed at the meeting, and the decision was made to take it back to staff. My sense, and I believe the sense of staff, was that the sentiment was that the Dylan report did not go far enough, and the issue of water management was not satisfactorily addressed. Following the October meeting, there was a sense that staff needed to go back and strengthen some of the restrictions. As we all know, this did not go over well with a significant portion of the residents who feared that these restrictions would reduce their ability to expand their homes and generally enjoy their property, and for many others who saw a potential for a significant reduction in the value of their property. This feeling was exacerbated by recent home sales and listings in the area that were substantially higher than any we'd previously seen, and an article in the Whig Standard. So two, effectively, two camps emerged, and that became obvious at the public meeting held in Memorial Hall earlier in the spring. In my previous life, I had a lot of experience in reconciling differences and helping to move toward consensus, but I am not able to see where consensus can be achieved here. In truth, although I certainly have read differently, uh, I have tried to look at this through the lens of all the parties involved, uh, and among them, the very talented developers who are there who are creating some beautiful and compatible homes, we have people who are very concerned about being able to continue to afford to live in a place where they fear that bigger homes will result in higher and perhaps unmanageable property taxes. We have people who are very concerned about flooding, people who are very passionate about property rights, people who are concerned that only Toronto people will be able to afford the new homes that are being built in the area, people who are very concerned about preserving the canopy, and many other people who have many different issues. At the end of the day, I truly believe that we will never reach consensus on how to proceed. If I believed for a minute that a deferral would allow us to find the common ground upon which we could build consensus, then that is what I would recommend. I do not see potential for that after all my discussions with the residents in this district and with the builders and with others. What I do see currently is a very unhealthy situation that pits neighbour against neighbour and has created bitter division and this needs to end. The staff have come up with a few recommendations that will address the more outlandish proposals for new construction. They have addressed quite fairly in my mind the lot coverage and height issues and their recommend recommendations include frontage, et cetera, combined with the proposed design guidelines that hopefully will address any issues around incompatibility. The reality is that this neighborhood, like many in Kingston, is and will continue to undergo change and this is inevitable. Furthermore, the Planning Department has asserted that they will continue to monitor the situation in Reddale and make adjustments as required as part of the Comprehensive Zoning Bylaw Review, which is currently underway. I really think that this is the proposed, that the proposal that is in front of us is the best that we can do at this time, and I am encouraging my fellow councillors to approve them tonight to be forwarded to Council. I am deeply sorry that we could not find more common ground but I am very confident that the, stunt, that the staff has done their very best to address the concerns of all of the parties. Lastly, I commit to, to, to those of you for whom the main issue was always water management, that that issue has not been forgotten, and I will continue to pursue that with the engineering department. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any further questions, comments? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, um, building off Councillor Hill's comment about um, looking at this in, in the future, I just want to ask staff to be very clear and for the benefit of residents as well, that through comprehensive zoning, additional tweaks can be made to the bylaw should that be desirable and should apparent changes need to be made uh, based on the development that happens between then and now. So changes through comprehensive bylaws are possible still going forward even if this passes. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Chair. Correct, we are working on the city's comprehensive harmonized zoning bylaw that is due to be delivered to council and to the community by the end of 2020. So as part of staff's recommendation, what we've proposed are the changes that you see before you, 
but have our commitment to continue to monitor the situation. We are seeing a very few number of development applications over the last couple of years relative to what we're seeing across the city. That said, we will continue to monitor to see how the practical application of the recommendations that we're making this evening to see how they're working and have a commitment to continue to work with the community, receive feedback, and we're always able to evaluate things further through that zoning process and make amendments at that time. Thank you, and one other question of before I make my comments on where I'm sitting with this file. We saw a few images tonight of new infill that happened between now and when they were built, obviously. This current bylaw would limit that new infill in a way that those images don't reflect. In other words, that type of home wouldn't be built if this is passed tonight because it would be a smaller size, potentially slightly lower height, and less lot coverage. Is that correct? Um, through you, Mr. Chair, um, yes, that's correct. Some of those type of homes would likely not be permitted um, based on the lot coverage and the, um, the changes in the way height is being measured is being proposed. Uh, thank you, one final through you, Mr. Chair. The other part of the work that st staff undertook as part of the last year and a bit of working through this is to look at the lot fabric it's, that's in the area, looking at the lot frontage, the lot area minimums, and looking at what the additional potential is for further land division in the neighborhood, which was some of the issues that created concern in the first mm -hmm. place. Mm -hmm. And we've determined that the opportunities for further land division are few, if any, that remain at all to be able to meet the current zoning provisions that are in place relative to the neighborhood. So to further subdivide lands would require a variance or a potential rezoning depending on what's being requested, which would also go through another public process where people could contribute through that process and council would have the benefit as well as staff as hearing any of that related to any of those further approvals that may be sought at a future time. So all of that information was thought about quite carefully in constructing what's come to you this evening, mm -hmm. um, just for this benefit. Thank you, so as per my comments, I haven't had the privilege of dealing with as many residents as the district councilor, and I respect the district councilor quite a bit and I take his word for not being able to see further consensus. Couple that with the fact, technically speaking, I think that there is a balance that's been found from the planning department. And then finally for me, the fact that tweaks can be made as we go along uh, within the next year even makes me very comfortable supporting the motion as it is. Thank you. Councillor Hutchison, you have the floor and then I'll turn the Chair, over to the vice. Okay. Um, I didn't hear a precise, it's probably there someplace, but the stormwater management analysis, what day does that do? So are you referring to the P study? Yes. So that work has been ongoing with the engineering department. I believe it's been concluded. Is that correct? Yes. Through you, Mr. J. Yes, that has been concluded. We've had a number of meetings with the engineering group and we're reviewing that study of the recommendations concurrently with preparing the planning recommendations that have come forward to the committee this evening. So it'll be not in the future that we'll be seeing it? Will we be seeing it? Uh, thank you, as that study was directed to be completed by the engineering, I'm not sure if they would publicly present that to EID, but I believe that they have done some public presentation in terms of the community, but whether a committee has received that, I don't know, as we were not responsible for that study directly. Okay, so we should probably inquire. Yes, you, acting CEO. Through you, Mr. Chair. So it, it has not uh, yet been presented to EITP, but that's something that I will be discussing with the engineering department so that the study, the, the outcome results of the study can be brought forward to EITP. I know it's something that's been of great interest to the community, and it will obviously include some recommendations in terms of next steps for work to improve the, uh, the area and, and the, um, the water management. Thank you. And I take it staff's position that um, changing the lot coverage for future housing in this, in Redendale, 
will significantly address the, um, the drainage and runoff problems because that was, I think, what most motivated council at the time. Thank you. you. Lot coverage is one of the key tools that exists through zoning to control the building envelope, which controls the amount of the property that becomes impermeable surface. So when you have less of a building envelope, you have more land that's available for passive infiltration of water. And that was the thinking and the analysis behind looking at the WSP work. Um, as we've understood the recommendations and as that study has been circulated to the community, it hasn't formally been presented to, EI to EITP, but understand it was made available uh, through email, maybe through the website as well, through their project managers, but that was the thinking relative to the 30% restriction being implemented through the recommended zoning changes. Fine, thank you. Um, okay, so on the proposal, um, I agree with the first two uh, councillors to, um, to speak here that this is uh, perhaps the best we can find at the moment. I'm a bit concerned about some of the, a couple of the measures that were dropped out of the uh, Dillon Consulting, which I thought were fairly innocuous, if perhaps helpful in terms of over, overlook and things like that, meaning this, the step backs above uh, the second floor and so on. Um, but I live in a district that is like <laughs> way denser than this district. This, I think this district is gonna be 22 units per net hectare and my district is 63. So different notions of privacy, I suppose. So it's, but you can perhaps understand that from people from other parts of the city are thinking, don't quite understand what all the fuss is about on that point. So, but I accept that people can have different views on these things. So I still took it seriously when I was reading the documents. So, but at the moment, I think this is um, where we have arrived with the t to and fro as described by Councillor Hill and so I will vote for it. And thank you to staff for what was a very long process. Thank you. And would you take the Take the, the chair. chair, recognize you. A couple of things that came up in the, that I think need to be addressed. One, there was a concern, and I think it was primarily a property rights concern about what we call our ribbon of life, which is the restriction along the waterfront. The reality is that that was made, why that's called ribbon of life is because it's meant to promote and maintain biodiversity and to not have development infringe on our water waterfront uh, and the fact that we're sharing it with a very biodiverse uh, aspect. So I, if that limits where somebody is able to put a patio, then I'm afraid that's a limitation that I think is justified. So a um, couple of other things. First of all, I've received a couple of emails from developers who have said, I thought you had a housing shortage. I just want to say publicly, Changing a 1,500-square-foot family home to a 4,000-square-foot family home does nothing for our housing shortage. Uh, and, and so that, I don't think, is a very solid argument on that issue. The other thing, uh, and I appreciate the gentleman from Queens, I believe, that mentioned that developers right now, with their existing uh, development rights, could go put in an active file, and we just like there's not just like with existing non-conforming use, that file 
would be judged by the existing zoning, which is very, very permissive. And so a further delay uh, by sending it back to planning again is only going to mean that there will be more of those larger developments that, in fact, this is meant to limit. And I know the report suggested 29 feet. Uh, the, the, so we've added three feet to the height. I think it would be difficult, frankly, with an LPAT, if there's an LPAT, uh, if that they've taken over for the OMB, and if, if they challenge this, that means the old bylaw continues through the challenge. And again, we're self-defeating the intention of this, all for three feet in height. And they would have a pretty solid case because this is the standard height for all of the city. So, so it would be a real challenge to argue. And an LPAT hearing, we can't use our own uh, planning staff because that's a conflict of interest. They have a report. So they can't speak against their own report. So it costs the city approximately $100,000 to go through an LPAT. It costs taxpayers that amount of money. And so, no, there isn't a complete consensus. I appreciate that. I've sometimes said consensus sometimes can be terribly overrated <laughs> because if it delays the process to the point that it becomes self-defeating or you have to give up so much, for it to become viable, then it's self-defeating. So I'm going to support this motion uh, tonight, and I think it's time we put this to bed and protect the community. And so I'll be voting for it. Thank you. You have the chair. Thank you. Councillor Chappelle. Thank you. Sir. I follow this file with uh, great interest as I do happen to know some residents that live in the area and it's a beautiful part of the city. I feel uh, a little bit of angst uh, and, and support for Councillor Hill because it's a difficult file and I, I loved your remark about <laughs> following up with uh, the former councillor. The concern that I have from this proposal is that I'm very fearful that another monstrosity like the one on Creer Avenue can be built. And so, I ask questions tonight about height because I don't want to see another three-story building there. That is my major concern that I, I don't feel it, it gets addressed uh, with this report. I had issues with the FSI utilization in the last because it didn't make sense to me. I'm glad that's removed. And so I also feel that um, the, the residents tonight that present, presented made some very valid and excellent arguments in their presentations, including the residents who are in the building trade. They also made some very compelling arguments. So we're left with a, a difficult situation. And so the one point that uh, you, Chair, have, have mentioned is that if this gets delayed further, then other abnormalities get built um, without, without being unchecked. And so it's going to be with great reluctance that I'm actually supporting this because I don't, my biggest fear is another three-story building. But I'm going to lean on the, uh, the uh, consultation and the comments that uh, Councillor Hill had consulted with constituents and support him on this file. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? Seeing none, I will call the question. All those in favor? Carried. Thank you very much, and thank you to the community for your patience in all of this. And I'm going to ask the vice chair to take over. It's a boy. I've got to go to the hospital. <laughs> we'll take a very quick recess to allow five minutes to allow... 
people to leave and people to come. Thank you very much. All right, so we have quorum now. We'll move to item B of the agenda, which is the comprehensive report on residential parking and driveways. And we'll follow the same order, turning to staff first to make a comment about the presentation. Um, thank you, and uh, through you, Mr. Chair, um, this is a comprehensive report regarding a proposed city initiated official plan amendment and a zoning by our amendment regarding residential parking and driveways. Um, the presentation here um, is, is similar to what we had presented at the public meeting, and um, uh, the slides are available at the time of questions. Right, so we'll turn it to members of the committee who wish to ask questions further to our discussion earlier in the year. We're not gonna run through the entire presentation because it's almost the same as before, but staff will be able to refer to the slides to answer questions that we may have, unless it's the will of the committee to hear the presentation again. All right, anyone else? Okay, with the request of the counselor, please run through your presentation. Okay. Okay, so um, just some background and context as it relates to the, these amendments. Um, as, um, as you may know, there has been a provincial direction to increase as of right permissions for second residential units citywide, and uh, council recently uh, passed amendments relating to the official plan and zoning bylaws to broaden second residential units across the city. Um, the expectation with these permissions is that on-street parking will be used more frequently and for longer duration than what is permitted by the parking bylaw. Um, in several areas of the city, there is limited ability for residential lots to provide off-street parking. Um, and um, the existing zoning provisions regarding parking in a driveway do not conform with the official plan policies. Um, so the primary intent of these amendments is to provide additional opportunities for off-street parking in residential areas while at the same time um, to balance the need for maintaining the streetscape and uh, neighborhood character. Uh, these amendments are supportive of second residential units. Um, they provide an opportunity to establish off-street parking spaces in situations where properties do not have access to a garage or a side or rear yard uh, for the purposes of parking. And they also contribute to enhanced accessibility with parking spaces uh, potentially being able to be located closer to the main entrance of a dwelling as a re result of these amendments. Um, so I just, I'm just going to qu quickly go over the existing official plan policies um, regarding front yard parking in low density residential um, areas. Uh, the official plan contains two sets of policies, uh, one for new development and one for existing residential areas. Um, for new development, front yard parking is not permitted uh, except for parking in a driveway leading to a permitted parking space in a garage side or rear yard. For existing residential areas, front yard parking spaces are discouraged and off street parking spaces are restricted to rear yards, side yards, and garages. Um, and section 4.6.60 of the official plan contains criteria for the review of requests to establish front yard parking. So um, in looking at these policies um, for low density residential development, the policies don't speak to new development in existing residential areas. So there are two sets of policies, like I mentioned. Um, however, there is a disconnect when new development is proposed in an existing um, residential area. Um, the existing zoning framework allows parking in a driveway in a portion of a front yard where the driveway leads to a permitted parking space in a garage, side, or rear yard. And uh, the maximum permitted driveway widths in a residential zone vary across the bylaws. Uh, however, generally speaking, um, um, they are um, six meters or 40% of the lot width, whichever is the lesser um, in Kingston Township and in the Pittsburgh Township bylaws. The old city of Kingston is regulated by bylaw number 8499, which doesn't 
have uh, these type of um, driveway restrictions. As well, the Cataraqui North bylaw has different sets of um, um, restrictions for driveways, which are not pr proposed to be amended as part of this uh, amendment because the, uh, uh, the Cataraqui North secondary plan applies to that area, um, and, 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 and that's why the zoning is, is, is different for that area. So this graphic just typically, just generally illustrates uh, situations in which parking is permitted in a front yard. So um, as shown in this uh, image, here's a garage and there's a car parked right in front of the garage. So in those type of situations, currently the zoning bylaws allow parking um, in a driveway in a front yard. Uh, the proposed official plan amendment uh, is intended to bring um, uh, the sections related to new and existing low density residential developments into one section. Um, and it's proposed to be amended to indicate that new uh, low density residential development will not have front yard parking except for parking in a permitted driveway as per the provisions of the zoning bylaw. Uh, so staff are proposing to remove the restriction that parking in a driveway is only permitted where that driveway leads to uh, a garage side or rear yard. And um, staff are also proposing to add a new criterion to section 4.660, which speaks to um, situations or criteria where front yard parking um, is uh, permitted beyond what's permitted in the zoning bylaw to ensure that uh, any of the driveway widenings do not impact uh, um, municipal trees located within the um, road allowance. So what the difference that it makes as it relates to the existing situation is um, this illustration on the left shows currently um, where parking is permitted in a driveway where it leads to a garage. What we are proposing to change is that whether or not the driveway leads to a garage, you can still park on um, within a driveway. The intent is not at all to permit front yard parking across the entire front yard. It's only permitted when parking is located in a driveway in, um, in a front yard. And also driveway widths um, are proposed to be regulated um, across zoning bylaw 8499, uh, 7626, um, 3274, um, and the downtown and harbor bylaw. So basically, um, there will be limitations with respect to um, parking of vehicles in a front yard. The zoning bylaw amendment um, is uh, proposed, it is proposed that it'll implement uh, this modification to the official plan policies. So um, um, staff are, like I mentioned, adding provisions or amending pre existing provisions for minimum and maximum permitted driveway widths, which is again 40% of the lot width or six meters, whichever is the lesser. Six meters can get two sides, two cars parked side by side on a lot. However, a lot would have to be at least uh, 50 feet in lot width for it to be able to accommodate a two car wide um, driveway. A staff are also um, proposing to amend the zoning bylaw to permit tandem parking areas, uh, tandem parking in areas where it is currently not permitted. So tandem parking means uh, one car or one vehicle parked right behind the other. In some zoning bylaws, this is currently permitted, whereas in some others, it's not permitted. However, recognizing that with uh, second units, um, um, there will be that additional need for parking spaces to be provided on private property. Um, this is a change that is being proposed. As part of this amendment, um, staff are also proposing some changes to the parking of recreational vehicles, watercraft, and trailers in residential zones. Um, these, uh, these type of vehicles are permitted to be parked in a garage or in any other building, or in a rear yard or interior side yard, uh, but they have to be at least um, one point, uh, one meter to, from any lot line, and these 
type of vehicles cannot occupy any required parking space or a side triangle. Um, so what that means is, for example, one single detached dwelling requires one parking space to be provided for the private automobile. So where these type of uh, recreational vehicles or watercraft and trailers are parked, they should not displace the private automobile onto the street. They can, so these type of vehicles can only be accommodated on the lot where um, they do not affect the required parking space. Um, currently, temporary parking uh, of such type of vehicles is permitted in the front yard or in an exterior side yard for 72 hours in any one calendar month. Um, this has been difficult to enforce for the city because staff are not out visiting uh, properties every day. So it, it has been a challenge to enforce this. Um, as well, staff have received um, uh, comments from several members of the public regarding uh, to the fact that this time limit is very restrictive. At times, people do need to bring in their recreational vehicles, watercraft, and trailers on, um, on their private properties for loading, unloading, or for maintenance purposes. Um, so based on that feedback received, uh, as part of this amendment, staff are also proposing amendments to the 72-hour time limit and changing it to a seasonal-based approach. Um, staff have looked at other municipal uh, examples as well where this has been implemented. Um, so as part of this amendment, a boat, motorhome, travel tra trailer, but not both of these, a personal watercraft, an all-terrain vehicle or other recreational vehicle, or a utility trailer may be parked in a permitted driveway in a front yard um, or in an exterior side yard between April 1 and October 31 of each year. Um, and similarly, snowmobiles may be parked in a driveway between November 1 and March 31st of each year. At all other times, these type of vehicles would either need to be stored in a garage in the rear yard or um, or off property, for example, in a storage facility. Um, also, as it relates to temporary parking, again, these type of vehicles must not, uh, uh, must not occupy any required parking space or any site triangle. So site triangle typically uh, applies to corner lots. Um, and it's intended to ensure that motor, ve motor vehicles um, and pedestrians on the road have uh, easy, have clear sight lines to the other, other street for safety purposes. Um, at the time of writing of the report, uh, staff had received 17 pieces of correspondence. Um, there were two additional pieces of correspondence received that have been including, included in the addendum um, tonight. Um, the staff recommendation is that this application for official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment be approved. Thank you. Thank you. Moving to the committee for questions, Councillor Chappelle. Yes, to you, uh, Deputy Mayor. Um, my question is regarding to, um, we didn't discuss it here, but when we originally looked at this proposal, there was a, a maximum length of 8.2 meters in a driveway. And there were a number of uh, residents that are, I don't know if they're here tonight, but they had uh, had correspondence with regards to trailers and, um, of, of uh, like 9.5 meters and, and uh, they had requested um, an opportunity to change that for a, a maximum length to be 9.5 meters because of the, when you put in that length, if they have the appropriate driveway, it doesn't preclude another car from parking, but that option should be available if they purchase a home in that regard. Can you comment on that? Yes, uh, you, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, Kat. Um, 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 the existing length of vehicles that is permitted, which is 8.1 meters, um, and, and also the comment received uh, from a member of the public with respect to increasing that length to um, over nine meters. Um, uh, through these amendments, we are trying to strike a balance between um, additional opportunities for parking on private property and also at the same time um, trying to balance the streetscape and neighborhood character. Um, we've also looked at other municipalities um, and the lengths of such type of vehicles that are permitted on private property. 
Um, uh, when the initial 8.1 meter length was implemented, that was based on uh, discussion with um, some local uh, recreational vehicle and boat dealers who sell these type of vehicles in the area and also based on a review of other municipalities. Um, and, and, and based on that, 8.1 meter uh, length was determined to be adequate. Uh, the other thing is that if, if the length of these vehicles that are permitted on private property is increased, um, it may be difficult to navigate those type of vehicles on narrow residential streets and may be difficult for these type of vehicles to be driven in and out of driveways. Um, based on these reasons, um, the, the maximum length of the vehicles uh, is not proposed to be increased at this time. Through you, Mr. Chair, I'm based I received and a, a fellow councillor uh, who has concern with this issue, I'll be putting forward a, a motion to amend the maximum distance um, length to 9.5 meters. Noted. Other question, Committee at this point? Councillor Sanik. Thank you, Mr. I just want to um, understand um, so that I can explain it to my constituents. So if there's a driveway and um, the homeowner has two cars, if they now park a boat on their driveway, they still have to have enough room in their driveway to accommodate their two cars. Is that right? Because what I think is going to happen is that because it's during the summer months from April to October 31st, some people are now going to assume that they can park one of their vehicles on the street all day long. And so I know I'm going to get questions about that if it's going to work out the way that, you know, it could. And I just want to be able to know, like, what I should do about that. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, it is not at all the intent of these amendments um, to displace uh, private automobiles on the street. Uh, the city does have a parking bylaw which only allows uh, parking on a street for, a, for up to 12 hours um, at a stretch. And also um, there's the winter parking restrictions that are in, in effect over the winter months as well. Um, so yes, so, so such vehicles uh, are not, would not be permitted to displace vehicles off property. Thanks so much for confirming that. And the question is, if they have a really big driveway, um, they could actually park, like, from April until October 31st, a boat, um, a jet ski, and a trailer with, with that. If their driveway is big enough and can accommodate, you know, like, their two cars and also those, like, we're not setting a maximum on the recreational vehicle, so they could actually have a boat, a jet ski, and a trailer on their driveway. Is that right? Um, through you, Mr. Chair, yes, that's correct. Thank you very much. Mr. Semple, did you want to add? Thank you, um, Mr. Uh, Chair. So I think just with respect to your, your question, Councillor Ostanek, as well, while the, while the intent of what's being um, proposed, you know, the intent is that sufficient parking is available for the um, for, for the home and their vehicles and the other um, the other recreational vehicles and such that are there. Um, in practice, you know, as, as Ms. Agarwal has noted, um, you are permitted to park any vehicle on the street, any motor vehicle on the street for up to 12 hours. And so in, in practice, the city would not know that the vehicle on the street is related to a particular residence and wouldn't be wouldn't be regulating it in that way. So users would be permitted to have a, a boat in their driveway and a car in their driveway, and they may park their car in public parking in other areas of, of the street. For, yes, for, for up to 12 hours. Um, and as Ms. Arval noted, the, and that would obviously not apply during the winter months. I have a question. Could someone take the chair? Councillor Chappelle. Chair, and recognize you. Question about building off Councillor Osanix. How will the changes in the bylaw, should it be passed, be communicated to the public? Um, um, thank you for the question. Um, uh, the, we will update the city's website with information um, as it relates to these changes. 
Sorry, if I could add to that too as well. Um, certainly as part of the enforcement work that we're doing across the city, as council knows, we do that on a proactive basis and one that's a very much an education-based approach first. So we anticipate with any change, um, there will be a period of time that uh, people need to get educated and understand what the new standard is. So we're able to look at doing some customized approaches to blitzes and sending officers to areas where we do have a lot of vehicles and, and typically we do take the education approach first and make sure that people understand what the requirements are prior to immediately going to enforcement measures. So that will always be part of uh, the process going forward as well if council supports these amendments. Thank you. I return to you. A final opportunity, questions from the committee? Seeing none, we'll move to the public. Would any members of the public like to speak? If so, a reminder, five minutes, name, address, and all questions from the public, and then staff will respond. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. So Frank Dixon, address earlier in the meeting. So I want to commend uh, staff's work on this. I think it's been thoroughly undertaken and uh, it's professional and um, has addressed uh, public concerns. So my kudos on that. Um, just a couple of specific examples um, on things I'm curious about and also may apply to where I live. Um, the case of a semicircular driveway in the front yard. Um, I know there's a number of places, uh, certainly in the more dense neighborhoods of the city, that already have these. Um, would they be allowed in the future, um, or is that on a case-specific basis looking at the spatial orientation of the property? And then, uh, second question, you spoke about tandem parking, and you had the case of two cars uh, being allowed on a driveway that's large enough, and then there's a question on say, uh, for a given, um, say, single, single residence, you have the possibility of a car, say, jet ski, uh, RV, and so forth being allowed. What about if you have a, a detached residence with more than one unit in it? Could it be more than two cars being allowed in a tandem situation? So that's one. And then the other one is, um, you spoke about um, RVs and so forth being allowed in driveways for short periods of time during the summer season. Could an RV be stored in the driveway during the winter season, like say for November through April, which is say non sort of camping situations, if there's enough space? So, thank you. Would other members of the public like to comment or ask questions for this bylaw? Going once, going twice. All right. Staff, if you could respond, please. Um, yes. Um, thank you for the comments. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, um, there was a question about uh, semicircular driveways. Um, the driveways that are already existing um, can continue to exist. There are some um, regulations in the zoning bylaws with respect to the minimum spacing between two driveways on a lot. Um, whether or not circular driveways would still continue or, or would still be permitted, that's also um, something that engineering typically looks at. Um, through their cut permits, generally speaking, it's not preferred uh, anymore. Um, that uh, one lot have more than one driveway or one more than one curb cut because it does have an impact on on street parking. Um, the second question regarding tandem parking, I didn't get it accurately. Um, I'm sorry. Can it... with permission of the chair, I will repeat the question for if you, if you repeat it in ten seconds. Right. It has to do with more than two vehicles being allowed in a tandem situation, if there's enough room. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so yeah, through, through the proposed changes, we are not uh, proposing any limitations on how many vehicles can be parked in a tandem arrangement. Um, 
And then uh, the, the last question was related to parking of uh, recreational vehicles in driveways over the winter months. That is not permitted. Only a snowmobile may be parked in a driveway over the winter months. Um, recreational vehicles would be required to be parked uh, in, in a garage in the rear yard or the side yard or off, off site over the winter months. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go back to committee for any final questions. Would you like to comment? Yeah. Well, Councillor Hutchison will move it, and then we'll have time for comments and other. OK. Yeah, we're looking to get it on the floor, so we need a mover. Councillor Chappelle. So now we have time for comments, and we heard earlier a potential amendment. Councillor Sandick. Thank you. So um, some people in my district are definitely for it, but <laughs> the majority of the comments I got back are against it, and it's for the aesthetics, and, uh, you know, they just don't want a neighborhood to be looking, you know, with the collection of recreational vehicles. There's been some problems already, like in, in Collins Bay Ridge in the past. And uh, so I am concerned about implementing it. Maybe not so much for the um, parking issue, but for the recreational vehicles in the driveway. But this report is the bylaws, like both at the same time, all together. So um, I do have an amendment to put on, and that's just so that staff will um, look at comment. You know, like they'll they'll keep looking at the situation, still monitor it you know, once we implement it, if it does pass at tonight and then passes at council um, to see if there's any changes that need to be made, you know, as people complain, or maybe it's much ado about nothing and it'll be totally fine, right? As right now, for me, it's hard to predict, but the amendment is, uh, Mr. Clerk, do you have it? And do you have a seconder, Councillor? Councillor Hutchison. that staff monitor the situation post-implementation bylaw regulations regarding the temporary parking of watercraft, recreational vehicles, trailers, et cetera, on a seasonal-based approach and review the effectiveness of these regulations as part of the new citywide zoning bylaw. And if this passes, then that's how I can tell those residents that were concerned about these changes. It's like I can tell them that the city, you know, is going to be watching about how this um, gets rolled out. So we have opportunity to on the amendment only. Councillor Chappelle. Okay. I, I certainly understand the intent of this uh, amendment, and I just want to ask staff if the way I read this, I, from my understanding and speaking with staff on a lot of bylaw issues, they already monitor and, and look at the effectiveness of bylaws as we go forward. And if this is simply a, a motion to direct staff just to have a, a special, special focus and lens on this issue, then I can support the motion. But I'd also like to hear from staff on, on knowing if they actually do the monitoring already as it would be moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. So certainly we are monitoring our policy at all times and that's based on, you know, the effectiveness of its application through uh, real life scenarios of development, but also on the basis of what type of, of complaints that we have coming in, what types of nuisance issues as well. So certainly we will continue to monitor this. This has been a contentious issue for the city, um, especially at least in the last three or four years of, of me working here. And we have heard, um, probably historically as well too, I just can't speak directly to that. Um, certainly there has been um, a lot of 
desire from certain members of council to see us address this and create some additional flexibility beyond what we have now based on a lot of um, pressure or concern from constituents in particular that have recreational vehicles and recognizing that the existing zoning permissions are quite restrictive um, in terms of the overall length. Um, for sure, we did evaluate that again to make sure that the length that was previously in there made sense um, from an overall talking to industry experts of you know what the average boat sales look like in the city and then when you're getting into more larger luxury size boats and then also looking at that with respect to other municipalities and feeling confident that the the length proposed is is what we want to continue to support. The other component of that too is the sight lines and making sure that the vehicles that are being stored in the driveway aren't creating safety issues in particular for children um, as cars are reversing at a driveways and when you have very long vehicles that are stored sometimes it prohibits your ability to see uh, smaller people in particular as you're trying to safely get in and out of driveways as well as some of the visual impacts as well from a neighborhood um, streetscape perspective so we will continue to monitor it it has been something we've received a lot of public concern about over time with how restrictive our policies are but certainly that ongoing review will be part of our work and as we roll out and if we have to get into an enforcement situation, that's always a very good time for us to receive feedback about the, the bylaws and whether they're working for the community or whether they require additional refinement. Other debate from the committee? Councillor Hutchison. I'll just say I'll support this. I'm, staff, no, I met with them about this. I'm really leery of this change. Um, now, when we get back to the main motion, I'll ask for a comment from Ms. Agnew. Um, so I think this would be a good idea. Most of the uh, monitoring is done on com based on complaints received, I believe, and uh, comments received, but mostly the complaints. And if it's allowed, I don't know quite how accurate that will be of the public's position. So a little extra effort, and I don't know, maybe we'll do it for a month before the end of the year period or something, just to see what people are really thinking, then I, I, I'm in support of it. Although I do think it'll be two to three years before we see the full impact of this. But a year? If that's reasonable to the committee and the staff, uh, I'll support that. Thanks. Mr. Chair, can I make one fire, uh, further comment? Please. Thank you, and through you. Uh, the other thing, just for Council's consideration as we look at creating additional flexibility, as you well know from a climate change perspective and based on the provincial direction that's been coming down through not only our official plan review, but some of the ongoing legislative changes that are being contemplated with respect to planning legislation and the provincial policy statement, the community will be under increasing pressure to look at um, more what we would call invisible forms of uh, densification or intensification, that's by second units. The provincial policy statement and some of the pieces with respect to Bill 108 are now suggesting that all municipalities need to have wording with respect to tertiary units. So adding a third unit potentially on an individual property. So as we continue to do that based on the area of the city and we make investments in multimodal transportation, Hopefully, the, what we want to do as a city is see the car dependency decline. But in the meantime, while we're under the expectation of allowing additional units on property, it's our intention to try to make sure we're planning for that as best as possible and to keep those vehicles within the private property and keep them out of the public right of way where they interfere with, with snow plowing, um, with the on-street parking bylaws that we have. So it's just something to keep in the back of your mind and, and why an initial... Um, an additional consideration above and beyond what's been going on because these are recent things that are coming from the province that we need to be creative and find additional ways to find the balance with the additional intensification that we're certainly being encouraged to do at a provincial level and also make change or make sense from a climate change perspective. Thank you. I have no one else on my list. So, Councillor Osanic, do you wish to comment further? All right, we'll call a question. All those in favor of the amendment? All those opposed, passes. So we'll go back to the recommendation as amended. Councillor Hutchison. 
Okay. Oh. Point of order, I yes. also have it on the floor. You do? Yeah. Right, so to clarify that, you have a desired amendment. Do you have a seconder? And we'll need language, too. Simple to facilitate those who live in the more rural parts of Kingston and to increase the maximum length from 8.2, uh, as written in the proposal, to 9.5 for those driveways that can permit uh, uh, recreational vehicle at size. And does it relate to, is it clause? Because I think there are 11, now 12 clauses in the recommendation. It's, it's in the report. Maybe staff can on how that would fit as an amendment. Mr. Chair, we have a, a point of uh, clarification for the committee as well on that. Um, so uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, I just wanted to clarify that the um, proposed um, size limits with respect to recreational vehicles, they, they apply to the residential zones only, not the rural area zones. Councillor Chappelle, does that change the intent? When I said the rural areas, I'm referring to the rural areas like Westbrook that do not have bus transportation and places on the east side with Councillor Bohm's area that have driveways sufficient enough to support that length of vehicle. So we need a seconder for the proposed amendment. Councillor Hutchison? It, it deserves to get on the table. All right, so we have another amendment. Mr. Clark, do you have language for that? Or do we need a two-minute recess to get it down? Let's just take a two-minute recess. Okay, we'll take a two-minute recess to get the language down. Okay, we'll come back together and hand it to Councillor Chappelle. Thank you, through you, Mayor and Chair. Um, due to the, the nature of the way the, the, the motions, the amendments are being uh, put forward to Council, it's a bit complicated to simply change the length at this time. But uh, since we've already passed the motion that, uh, from uh, Councillor Osanic that we'll be going through ongoing review and consulting with planning staff, then ongoing review will go forward. I think we can just leave it as is, and I'm going to withdraw that motion. Okay, so the proposed amendment is withdrawn to the recommendation as amended. Uh, any further discussion? I had you on my list. Councillor Hutchison. Well, um, as Agnew um, jumped the shark there, the uh, <laughs> and Nancy said what I was going to ask, said what I was going to ask her to say, but I, I know she's got uh, the, uh, I know she's got like 12 other reasons for doing this. <laughs> because all I remember is going to meet with her and Secreti and, and, uh, and she spoke for I don't know, two minutes straight <laughs> about all the reasons. <laughs> and the, so the most important was the one she gave here, and that is the problem, the, t the going, uh, allowing for secondary suites, which I support in general, but now the rubber is sort of hitting the road there with this guy over here. And, <laughs> and of course, we don't want the public thoroughfares crowded up. If you want to, and, and in the winter, like it's a huge cost to even get started to remove the snow with cars in the way, right? So, because we've had it costed before. I think it was 185,000 just to get started, some crazy number like that. So I'm really divided because I see the logic of it but I think it's gonna go down like a lead balloon once people realize what we're doing. Then they're gonna ask us about secondary units. And I'm gonna say, the province made me do it, right? <laughs> and the ter tertiary things, I don't think people realize what that means. That means basic, in my view, I've always had the view, it starts going to park, which is sort of near central, right? Which will ring a bell with all of you. You know, it's, it's suburban. But those houses are imminently dividable. Im imminently? That's the wrong word. But easily dividable. I mean, for relatively, it's expensive, but not that expensive. And so then that means more parking. And that's going to happen someday because now it's of our, as of right, right? The secondary suites. And as of right, tertiary, it's going to impact, it could impact everybody. It'll move from the center out, probably. 
You know, my district, we have like a, so many illegal units, it's hard to tell what's legal, what's not. So I'm really torn <laughs> about how to vote on this because I feel like I'm putting my uh, head in the sand if I don't vote for it. At the same time, I think it's gonna be really rather, in a while, it'll take a while, unpopular. And for good reasons, aesthetic good reasons that almost everyone can appreciate. So that's my piece. And um, committee can do with it, with it, whatever they want. I'd love to hear what other people think. Other members of the committee? I'll make one comment about if this were to be voted down, a reminder to the committee that you'll need to provide, we'll need to provide a planning rationale tonight as to why it can't go forward and why our understanding of planning is better than staff's. So that's a reminder. And then with that reminder, can someone take the chair? I'll just quickly comment on it as well. Councillor Chappelle, you wanna take the chair again? I take chair as you. Thanks. So I mentioned it at a public meeting, or the public meeting about this. I've had a number of residents come forward in strong support of this in both areas of my district, on the east side in Waterloo Village and in Bayridge East, um, which is actually the west portion of my district, ironically enough, and uh, brought residents to this chamber uh, when we were councillors elect for Councillor Candon, my predecessor, to present in support of. So. I'm going to continue in that vein and be in favor of it and building off my own comment that I don't think we have a good enough reason above what staff has recommended to justify voting it down. So please vote in favor. Thank you. I'll take the chair back and last call for committee. We'll go to vote. I'll return for you. Thank you. We'll go to vote the recommendation now 12 clauses as amended. All in favor? All opposed? <laughs> and it passes. Okay. Where did my agenda go? There we go. Yeah. All right, so that deals with motions. Any notice of motions? No. Seeing none. Any other business arising? Seeing none. Correspondence. Don't forget that there is a bunch of correspondence in the addeds. The next meeting, the planning committee is scheduled for October 3rd at 6.30, right here. Motion to adjourn. Councillor Hill, second by Councillor Chappelle. All in favor? Thank you.